Listeners, my name is Shannon Cooney from Merrick Property Group Real Estate Agency and a very proud sponsor of the Paracave podcast. If you own a property in the Penrith LGA or Lower Blue Mountains and would like to know what it's worth in today's market, give me a call on 0421 588 Broadcasting live from the Paracave. Hello and welcome to another bumper episode and another bumper year of the Paracave podcast. My name is Troy Warner and I'll be your host this week and every week in 2023. Now, before we get into this week's interview, uh, I hope everyone had a great Christmas and New Year's and a break if you were able to. Um, and just to let you know, this year on the podcast, there will be more content for you to listen to uh, and more to look at. As yes, the Paracay podcast will be dabbling in putting some content on its YouTube channel with videos on there already uh, and more to add as well to look at and enjoy. Um, Also, I will be introducing a new weekly podcast that I'm involved in uh, that you may or may not have heard me talking about last season. Uh, It's called the Talking Para Podcast where myself and three other para lads Uh, chat about all things Parramatta week to week. We preview games, we review games, uh, we talk about Parramatta issues uh, or uh, Parramatta uh, things you could say, Uh, not issues but things, uh, Parramatta, all things Parramatta related Um, and that way we get the fans aspect. So stay tuned for that one throughout 2023. And also, as the NRLW season approaches sometime in 2023, I'll be joined by a female host to discuss that side of uh, not only the game, uh, but also the Parramatta NRLW side of things as well each week. So looking forward to that one for sure, as that side of the rugby league is a very exciting Great brand of football, uh, and of course the Parramatta NRLW side went on to the grand final, unfortunately lost to the Newcastle Knights, but still a massive ride for them, so looking forward to starting up that one as well. And there will be some other exciting content and projects connected to the podcast coming later on in the year that I'm pretty excited about and to share with you later on as well. So a big year coming up, an exciting one. So thank you for the support and listening each week and may you enjoy the content that comes your way each week as well because that's what I'm here for. I'm here for the fans. So I really hope that you enjoy the content that I produce on the social media channels and also the podcast as well. Uh, And uh, yeah, I hope you really enjoy it. Now, enough of me talking. It's about probably time that we should probably get into the first interview for the year. And it's with Mr. Martin Afire. Listeners and viewers on socials, you might have seen the sneak peek that I put up yesterday, Uh, but during the chat, that was a little bit of the content of the chat that we had uh, with the rugby league legend that Martin is, Uh, but during the chat, we discussed winning Challenge Cups and Lance Todd trophies for being the man of the match in those Challenge Cup finals, winning the Man of Steel Award, which is equivalent to winning the Dalian Player of the Year Award here in Australia, but winning the Man of Steel Award in England for being the best player in the English Rugby League, Uh, having a statue outside Wembley Stadium, um, and also the try that that statue is depicted from, which is uh, he scored that for Wigan against Leeds in the 1994 Challenge Cup final, which I'll post up for you to see during the week. So keep your eye out for that one. It is a, it is a cracker of a try. Uh, also representing his country in rugby league. And with myself being a para fan and having spoken to Lee Odenryan about it, I 
also chat with Martin about that famous race in 1992 at Parramatta Stadium and get his side of that race as well. Um, I could not have interviewed Martin and not asked about that. That is for sure. But all that and much, much more coming your way during the chat, which is all brought to you by major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club in the club shop. Uh, and also a, co- a shout out to co sponsor Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group, the Stubby Club. Uh, and remember, use your Paracave discount code at the checkout for a 10% discount. The footy season is fast approaching, so get your gear from the Stubby Club. And also, Bo Cook from Loan Market, your local Penrith mortgage expert. And how do I know? He is the local market, local Penrith market mortgage expert. Well, Bo and his team have helped myself and my wife Amanda with a home loan. So we have that personal experience of what Bo and his team can do for you during these difficult financial times. And he will get the best deal for you. Contact Bo today on 0401. 213-236 213-236 and get in contact today for a free chat and see what Bowie and his team can do for you and let him know that you heard it here on the Paracave podcast. And also introducing a new sponsor, Brightside Detailing and Ceramics, uh, run by Scott. Now Scott is a certified detailer with 20 years experience in the industry And he does everything from car detailing, paint correction, ceramic coating, and also headlight restoration. And again, I've had that personal experience of a job well done having my headlights restored to my car. And it certainly was mind-blowing, the difference from what they were to what they are. from what they were to what they are now after Scott made uh, fixed it up and looked after it and made them sensational. Uh, you can contact Scott on Instagram at brightside underscore detailing underscore ceramics uh, and let him know that you heard it here on the Paracave podcast. But we'll have more details about that one coming soon so stay tuned for that one thank you to all the sponsors with your support it helps the podcast grow and reach more people which is much appreciated but i've been uh, blabbing on for uh, a few minutes now you don't want to hear me you want to hear the chat with chariots of fire that's what you're hanging out for not myself and so Let's have a listen to his rugby league story. As I said, a player that I grew up watching rugby league is a really interesting story. So as Hindy says... Get a beer, coffee, whatever you want. Sit back, relax, and enjoy, and let's get straight into it. Hi, uh, Martin Afire here, former Wigan, London Broncos, Eastern Suburbs, Sydney uh, Roosters. Uh, how many clubs do you want me to list <laughs> and mention? Uh, former rugby league uh, professional player and now uh, I'm more of a sustainability and climate action uh, brand ambassador and spokesman. Oh, Gary Connolly and Martin Afire trying to make some space. Now then, Martin Afire, he's got Alan Tate to beat. People were saying he was out of form. Well, there's his answer. Wonderful effort. (laughs) 
You'll see here, this is, this is a sign of a great play. Your team's under pressure, you're in your own 22. All of a sudden there, he's bumped off Neil Harmon. He comes out now, Tate does well here to try to dictate which way Martin's going to go, but Martin, the fire is just too quick for Alan Tate. And that's just uh, a perfect athlete there. Good work, Martin Afaya. Certainly, once uh, Martin Afaya gets clear, he turns at Alan Tate, and then when he puts his head back, then when that long strike gets going, well, neither Innes or Tate have any chance. A wonderful effort, and he must be tired. And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast is a legend of rugby league, most notably in uh, England, but indeed the world of rugby league. He's a try-scoring machine, scoring well over 500 tries in both club games in Australia and England, uh, and also internationals. Uh, he's a Man of Steel award winner uh, for being the best player in the English competition, a Lance Todd Trophy winner on two occasions, uh, for being the best player in the Challenge Cup. is an inductee in the English Rugby League Hall of Fame. He's awarded a MBE as well, has done some commentary, appeared on numerous reality TV shows. His nickname is Chariots. Welcome to the Paracay Podcast, Mr. Martin Afire. Thank you very much. And uh, don't forget the statue outside Wembley. I always like to mention that. <laughs> oh, yes. Don't worry about that. There is also, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. That's a massive thing to talk about for sure. Now, before Rugby League came about, uh, I believe you were quite the talented sportsman playing cricket and rugby union and even fencing at school. Yes, um while rugby was always my first love as an 11-year-old, my parents, a bit of my background, my parents sent me to a boarding school at the age of 11. Uh, up until then, uh, I was just at an ordinary um, primary school in London, uh, playing games like British Bulldog, which is basically when people just literally have to tag you and you have to run past them, playing kiss chase and playing football in the playground. And uh, my parents sent me to this crazy boarding school, which only played rugby. And uh, I literally picked the ball up and ran with it and, uh, you know, found that I really loved it. But at boarding school, you know, there's lots of time to kill. So I was a keen uh, cricketer during the summer. Uh, my first sport where I, um, you know, started to take it really seriously was fencing indeed. Uh, but around about the age of uh, 14, 15, I decided that, um, you know, I'd um, concentrate on uh, rugby during the winter months, which uh, was obviously a winter sport and still is rugby union. Um, uh, and cricket in the summer. So, uh, uh, rugby union was, was a, an amateur sport, so you know I, I couldn't see myself, you know, making a career out of it. So that's why I started to really kind of specialise in cricket during the summer. You know, when I left school in '85, a long time ago. Now I uh, went down to Essex Cricket Club. A guy called Ray East, who was a spin bowler, took me down there. Uh, used to uh, practice with the uh, John Lever and Graham Gooch, who I oh, yeah. famously bowled out once. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I uh, played one second eleven game for um, for uh, Essex, uh, but didn't get any wickets, didn't get any runs. It was it lasted three days, and I was thoroughly bored. So I just thought I'd uh, you know uh, try rugby union, and I thought if I get a cap for England, somebody will give me a job. So that was my only really <laughs> life plan after I left school. So then, did you think that rugby union was going to be your career path in in sport? Well, I always heard about this game called rugby league, and um, you know, I knew that you could earn money at it, but it wasn't something I was focused on. Okay. I knew a guy called uh, Terry Holmes, uh, a great Welsh scrum half, um, got signed for about eighty thousand pounds. I saw in a newspaper, and that really did pick my ears up. But I thought, you know, I'm going to get capped for England. At one day and maybe you know in a distant future i could see myself uh potentially playing rugby league but I didn't see it in my imminent future but uh you know what they say never say never you never know what's around the corner yeah that's it so um obviously seeing the uh dollar figures then is then rugby league came into your life who were your rugby league idols uh growing up uh either australian or english I didn't have any uh, rugby league idols, as I say. Rugby league was something I viewed from afar. They used to show it on um, grandstand. We only you know, used to have like three channels back back in the day before, um, you know, c cable TV or Sky TV, and you know the plethora of channels we have now. But yeah, it was, it was limited. 
back then. And, uh, you know, Saturday afternoon was either watching wrestling on ITV or rugby league, which was always on a muddy pitch and it always seemed to be Hull versus Hull KR. And it didn't seem at all appealing okay. playing this slow game in the mud uh, with a load of brutes and it looked very violent. And I thought, oh, that's not for me. So my idols growing up were the likes of, uh, you know, the great uh, Welsh players of the 70s, um, uh, J.P.R. Williams, uh, Gareth Edwards, uh, Phil Bennett. You know, his lovely sidesteps and the mercurial play, you know, far more exciting than the English rugby union team of the 80s, even though we had the likes of David Duckham and, and Woodward. But, you know, it was the Welsh rugby teams that I looked up to. Okay. And, um, yeah, I didn't really have any rugby league idols. Uh, I do remember watching, obviously, Wigan uh, come to prominence when they, they started, I think, uh, uh, you know, so I used to see them, but um, yeah, I didn't really have any rugby league idols, and and I didn't see rugby league in my future at all. It was just after I left school, played two years at Roslyn Park playing rugby union, uh, played in the Hong Kong Sevens, the Middlesex Sevens. You know, when Swing Low was first ever sung at um, Twickenham, and when I was on the pitch playing for Roslyn Park, and um, yeah, it was just the fact that I didn't get selected for the first. Rugby Union World Cup for England in 1987. We were playing in the, the final trial uh, for London versus the North yeah. against Rory Underwood and scoring two tries in that game and thinking, I'm going to get picked to go and play for England in the, in the World yeah, Cup. Definitely. I always used to say I was an internet sensation before the internet because, you know, people were talking about me. But, um, yeah, it wasn't to be. And Doug Lawton, the witness coach, um, uh, you know, uh, they always say it's about timing. And he uh, offered me a contract, which I couldn't really refuse, um, at the right time, I, I was, uh, you know, just really pondering my future. What was I going to do? I thought I'd outgrown Rosin Park. I was potentially going to go and play at Wasp or Bath. Um, yeah, and he just came at the right time. And I thought, you know, what the hell? Um, you know, I don't know when Rugby Union is going to become professional. And if I waited for Rugby Union to become professional, I would have waited, you know, another eight years, by which time I, I would have been pushing 30. Yeah. And, uh, you know my career would have potentially been behind me. So, you know, going to play rugby league was the, the best decision I've ever made in my life, really. So then, anyway. <laughs> well, before signing with Witness, is it true that the St. Helens board said that you were an uncoordinated clown? <laughs> Bit rough? Yes. Um, this is only something that I, um, I've i heard through um, a, a famous uh, BBC commentator, Ray French, who, um, uh, as uh, folklore says, um, it was in a pub in St. Helens and two of his former pupils, because he was a school teacher as well as, a, I think, a dual code international, two of his former uh, uh, pupils came into a pub and said, we've just been playing against this terrific winger uh, down at Rosin Park who uh, picked the ball up uh, just in front of his own try line on the left-hand side, went to the right-hand side of the pitch, did a, a left turn and went up the field and scored a try. And I, I remember scoring that try against Waterloo. And, um, yeah, so he, he informed the St. Helens uh, directors who apparently sent someone down to watch me. Obviously, I didn't have a very good game yep. because reports uh, are that I was an uncoordinated clown and wasn't worth bothering with. Um, uh, he then went on to, um, uh, you know, speak to Doug Lawton, the witness coach, uh, who came down and saw me. I think he actually saw me on TV playing in the Middlesex Sevens and the Hong Kong Sevens, uh, uh, two competitions in which I did very well in, obviously thought that I had something. And then uh, apparently went to uh, the Roslyn Park um, Club, uh, phoned them up and asked them for my number. Just think in this uh, modern world, going yeah. to a club, uh, ringing yeah. them up and asking for a player's number and getting it, you, it just would be unheard of. Yeah, but he definitely. said he was a reporter and, and obviously Roslyn Park thought they were going to get some free publicity. So they gave him my number and the rest, they say, is history. Well, it certainly was egg on their faces, the St. Helens board, because uh, you set a club try-scoring record and you topped the league in try-scoring and 42 tries in your debut season. You got the Man of Steel award and no doubt that really uh, is high on your list of achievements. Absolutely. You know, coming into this game as a newbie, um, you know, I didn't score a try. So I think to my third game and... I I remember, I think it was against um, Runcorn Highfield in the uh, in the Lancashire Cup. And uh, I think my first uh, two games, I think I did everything but score in those first two games. And I remember Doug Lawton coming up to me in the change rooms, um, 
just before the game and uh, gave me a little pat and said, Martin, I can't buy a try scoring winger who uh, doesn't score any tries. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't get much um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, big pressure in the, in the press because I was just literally a, a no one. You know, it was only a couple of lines when I signed, you know, witness sign um, promising uh, Rosden Park rubber union winger. But when I got there, you know, Doug had hyped me up so much to everybody that, you know, I was going to be this sensation and, you know, I was going to be one of the greatest swingers ever to play the game and I, I must admit at the beginning I found it a bit of a burden because I was like does he say this just to get me to sign or does he actually believe this but you know it's true what they say you know you have to have belief in yourself and there was something about Doug he was a great communicator and he managed to instill some confidence in me you know because I was a pretty confident fellow but you know to go to a place I didn't know I signed for witness before I'd even stepped foot in the town yeah. and you know and everyone was looking to me you know witness I think the season before they had a pretty rocky season, you know, almost, I think they did pretty well in the cup, but they, they almost got relegated that season. And then the se season that I joined, you know, we went on to, to do the double win in the, the league and the premiership. And, um, you know, have a fantastic season. I was man of steel, you know, as I say, went, went on st tour to Australia. So after that first season, you know, um, you know, Dougie was right. And <laughs> obviously, you know, uh, uh, St Helens had a, a bit of egg on their face. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, you mentioned there your earned selection for uh, Great Britain on the Tour of Australia, and uh, you were looking to do that for Rugby Union. So doing that in Rugby League, no doubt a, a massive, um, proud moment in your career, representing Great Britain. Yeah, uh, fantastic. You know, anyone who, um, you know, plays the sport of rugby, be it Union, or, or league or whatever, you know, you want to become an international, you want to play at the highest level, you want to, you know, aim for the stars. And, um, you know, a lot of um, rugby union players around the 80s, you know, swap codes like Jonathan Davis, who came out to play in, in Australia a few late, years later as well. Um, you know, Vaiga Tugamala, you know, a great all-black fan of Botica, um, uh, you know, a host of uh, English international internationals as well and of that crop of players I was the only one who wasn't an international I was only 21 you know a lot of players played in that 87 World Cup you know likes of Alan Tate who was a teammate of mine at, at Widnes and later to go on and play with Leeds uh, and the and the Rugby Union British Lions as well so there was a lot of players and you know none of them you know ended up having the career that I had and and creating the legacy that I had you know and I always say in life it's not where you start it's about where you, you finish and you know obviously I went out to to Australia in 88 with a bit of a, a target on my uh, uh, back, you know, took a lot of ribbon early on after, you know, not the greatest uh, uh, performances in the first test and a few of the opening games, you know, I think I had a, uh, a much better g game, um, you know, as I as I progressed through the tour, you know, that famous uh, against, uh, you know, uh, the, the Kangaroos and that third test at Sydney when no one gave, gave us a chance, you know, an iconic victory player against some great players, you know, and Wally Lewis and Mike Gregory scoring that, that, that famous try at the end of the game. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I really finished it on a high and obviously, you know, it earned me, um, you know, a, a contract with Eastern Suburbs in 89. Um, you know, and I, I was back in, in Sydney in 91, you know, uh, with St George. And, you know, I had a fantastic season with St George, you know, if not for a bit of a... Um, uh, an abductor um, injury which slowed up my try scoring rate you know in the last couple of matches um, you know St George are uh, you know pretty close to, to, to getting into the final series there so you know it wasn't to be you know I had the chance to stay at St George in, in 91 because that was the year that I'd, I'd finished with Widness and, and wanted to you know get myself to Wigan and had to spend half a season at the game which was pretty tough for me but I managed to get myself to Wigan, but yeah, I had the chance to stay with Brian Smith at St George, and um, you know, thought to myself that you know Wigan was the place for me because I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to end up when I retire living in England. And I know that you know if you create a legacy somewhere, it's better to create a legacy in the country that you yeah. reside in. Um, but you know, I had you know short stints in Australia, but still managed to um, you know. Be uh, be remembered. Uh, you know, someone sent me uh, a clip the other day on, on YouTube 
of a horse called a uh, chariot oh, right, yeah. of fire uh, and the greyhound as well so you know people are naming horses and greyhounds <laughs> and stuff after you and uh you know still getting the odd mention on the matty shons footy show over there big shout out to matty johns the footy show i love that show and uh, you know get to watch it whenever i can over here in england and yes yeah, so i still have a, a strong affinity and connection with uh you know australia obviously wigan played in that 92 Nissan Sevens, you know, you know, on a waterlogged pitch yep. uh, to beat the Brisbane Broncos. And obviously, you know, Wigan winning in 94, you know, beating the Broncos. And obviously the, the, the tests are uh, matches that I played in in 92, obviously that famous victory down in, in Melbourne. And so, you know, even though I haven't had a, a full career, you know, and achieved the heights of like what likes of Ellery or Adrian Morley or, you know, the Burgess brothers have, have done, in um, Australia and, uh, you know, James Graham and, and, and a host of English pl players. John Johnson, what he's doing now, a fantastic player at Canberra Raiders. I love watching Australian footy and, um, you know, it goes back to, I remember me when I first signed for Witness and I remember asking somebody just in, in Witness, you know, because I, I, I was very ignorant, but I always, I'm very much about, you know, the mind and learning about things. And I remember asking somebody, Who, who's the best rugby league player in the world? And then someone says to me, oh, I don't know, it's some guy in Australia called Wally. And I just thought, what, Wally? Because where I came from in London, Wally is not a great yeah, term for yeah. somebody. It's an insult. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it, you know. So, I, you know, I used to get the Micron videos and I used to love um, just hearing the Aussie commentators. And I was like, oh, God, one day I've got to play in Australia. And I just knew that. I don't care how many Super League titles you've won. I don't care how many Challenge Cup finals you've won as an English player or player playing in England. And I don't care how many tries you've scored. You could score a thousand tries in English football, even though there are some great Australian players like, you know, E.T. or what it is have come and played in the English competition and necessarily haven't had the success they've had in the NRL. But as an English player, you cannot be considered even in the breadth of anything if we're talking about the greatest of all time or, or even to be considered anything if you haven't stepped foot and won something in australia be that uh, you know whatever it is be that you know world club challenge uh, a test match uh you know yeah. a, a grand final you've got to have i don't care what success it is you've got to go to australia and have some success you cannot play your whole career in england and you know i, I hate it because it's it, it's something that's not even said out loud but any english player knows it you know, any English player knows it, and that's how important Australia is. Um, you know, you know, it was, it was great uh, in '91. You know, to go and watch, um, you know, the state of origin. You know, live in the flesh and to, yeah. and to see it. Because I said, I, my only, um, it was like liking it to go into America or seeing in you know, Hollywood. If you're an actor, you, know, you want to go to Hollywood. If you're a rugby league player, you've got to go to Australia and test yourself. Um, you know, it's all very well because yeah, we beat Canberra Raiders. Um, in '89, in you know, which is a fantastic team with likes of Ricky Stewart, yeah, definitely. Uh, in their Mal Meninga, you know, I beat them, you know, and I've won test matches in England as well. But you know, you got to go to Australia and beat to get true respect as a, as a rugby league player. You got to go to Australia and win in Australia. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it <laughs> whether it's sevens, whether it's a test match, whether it's a grand final, whether it's a World Club challenge. Go and win it in Australia, then you can walk. You can. Uh, walk tall and you know uh, and, and I did at a time when you know um, you could go and have you know ha have one foot here and one foot there but now you do because the you know the, the seasons season. run at the same yeah. time you've got to you've got to make that um, uh, commitment and go out there and uh, you know um, and play in the NRL you know there's not many you know Lions tours and and you know uh, I know England had a chance back in uh, you know 2017 to to, to win the World Cup, but there's not many opportunities. You know, thankfully I had uh, you know a few opportunities to play in, in Australia, and you know thoroughly enjoyed them. Thoroughly enjoyed the lifestyle. Um, got you know one of my old, good old schoolmates, uh, Ben Watts, um, who's uh, the uh, sibling to Naomi Watts, the the Australian actress. Okay. Uh, he lived in Australia, so I, uh, me and Ben, my old um, school buddies, went to boarding school together. You know, Ben and Naomi now live in. Uh, in the Hamptons in Australia, and I'm sorry, in, in America, and I, and I go and visit them there. But um, yeah, so it was always good to, to go, come to Australia. And, you know, I spent a bit of time there just, you know, after uh, tours and, and, and competitions and, and really did find an affinity. But I just knew that I couldn't make that commitment to, you know, play a whole season there because I just knew that, you know, I was about, for me, sport is about legacy. And I knew that I had to be in England. I had to be playing at Wigan uh, to create that legacy. And, and, and I just feel that if I, um, 
hadn't done that, I would have been a fish out of water, you okay. know, if I'd have spent yeah. all that time uh, doing that and then come back to England, uh, you know, nobody would have known who I who I am. <laughs> well, let's hope that your fellow countryman, Josh Hodgson, who's now moved to uh, Parramatta, um, first season yeah. at Parramatta now, can uh, win the competition because it's been a while since Parramatta's won the competition. I think we're going into 36 years, I think, now, or 37 years. So, wow. Um, a let's long hope, time between drinks. <laughs> that's it. So let's hope he can bring some good luck to Parramatta. Now, you mentioned uh, just quickly there Brian Smith as well, the former Parramatta coach. Um, what was he like as a coach for the time that you spent with, with Brian? He was, um, he was a very good coach. You know, you get different types of coaches. You know, I had a, a coach at the beginning of my rugby league career, um, Doug Lawton. He was very much like a father figure to me. You know, I could do no wrong. You know, as long as I was scoring tries, he was happy. He didn't really expect you know, much hard yardage out of me. The only time I really went into a dummy half position at, at witnesses, uh, you know, near our own guy goal line as if yep. we wanted a penalty because people couldn't just resist you know smacking me across the chops so um yeah you know he, he was like that and then you know when I went to Wigan I John Boney was very much of a, a challenging coach you know he wanted so much out of you and you know it was more than scoring tries and I remember famously after a, a Challenge Cup semi-final against Bradford uh, in my first season you know just I'd just been signed from witness for 440,000 which was an astronomical fee back then Definitely. It, it's even today even in today's money, you know, imagine paying 440,000 cash for a, uh, a winger in 2023, you know, that that would, you know, raise eyebrows. So imagine what it must have been in uh, 1992. And, you know, it had thoroughly had a lot of success. Um, but after a semi-final, I think I scored a hat. Uh, I think I scored five tries in the semi-final against Bradford. And I, and I, you know, I was feeling pretty smug with myself and I had a good game and, and in the, the debrief, you know, a video session the day, day after, he said to me, Martin, apart from those five tries, you didn't do anything else. What else did you do? And I thought he was actually joking. Yeah, okay. And I started to laugh. Yeah. And he's straight face. I was like, no, he's being serious. He's being serious. But that's the way that kind of coach John Money was. You know, he challenged you. You know, he didn't wrestle your laurels. He was the kind of coach that if you, you know, didn't have a, a great game, then he'd probably look at all the good things you did and, um, you know, try and build you up. And if you had a great game, he wanted more from you. And, you know, and when, you know, I found that strange, you know, when different coaches try and play mind games with you and all that. You know, I was just pretty much a straight scooter. I just went out there, tried to score as many tries as I could. And if I didn't, I, was, I, I cried <laughs> to myself. And if I did, I was happy and I moved on to the next one. Uh, but Brian Smith was a bit of a, a, kind of a strange character. I didn't think that I would warm to him because... He was, uh, um, uh, you know, previously before he was at St. George was, I, I think it was at Hull here, but he also used to be, do a lot, bit of colour commentating okay. for the, um, for a programme called Scrum Down when I was at Witness. And, I, you know, I was a little bit of a, you know, a showboater, a little bit of a, a larrikin, as you say, <laughs> in Australia, you know, like to celebrate a try. So I used to get excited about it. I used to look forward to it. And the, the crowd used to look forward to it. So they always knew that if mine scored, it would be a celebration. He would, um, you know, get excited. And we could get excited and the children would run on the pitch and it was a massive celebration and we'd win. And it was a big party. Yeah. And he always used to, to, to uh, call me out in commentary and say, you know, say it was too much and it was, I was this and I was that. And so I just assumed he didn't like me. So when the opportunity to go to St. George came about, I was a bit apprehensive, you know, I didn't know whether to take it or not. Originally in, in 91, I was meant to go back to East because I had a good season with East in 89, scored a few tries. Uh, I think 1990, I went on tour to New Zealand with Great Britain. So 91 came around, I was, you know, thinking I'm going back to St. George and then, sorry, going back to Eastern Suburbs. And then um, all of a sudden, Eastern Suburbs, for some reason, cancelled my contract. Uh, oh, okay. I think there was some kind of, kind of mix-up because I think I'd put Ellery Hanley down as my, you know, plus one on my, you know, because he was going to come out and spend a bit of time with me. And maybe they thought I wasn't serious or whatever, but they cancelled my contract. I don't know what it is, you know. I'd love to to hear from Nick Politis. I think he's still involved with the Roosters. You know, yeah. As to officially why my uh, contract was cancelled because to this day I do not know why they cancelled my contract okay, and then wow. just out of the blue I was offered this contract by St George and I thought to myself you know what I'm going to go out there and show them 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really did, you know, feel like I got the last laugh because, you know, I scored a, a hat-trick versus the Roosters at the Sydney Football Stadium. And I really enjoyed that day and uh, <laughs> had a fantastic time at St George. You know, uh, I did end up going back to, to East in 93. I only played one game and <laughs> dislocated my shoulder oh. at... Um, at, uh, at Penrith, Penrith Stadium. Oh, yes. Um, so so that, that wasn't a, a great end. You know, I was playing too much rugby at the time. You know, looking back, uh, you know, I think for about nearly nine, ten years, I was either on tour, um, you know, playing in the NRL or, you know, going out and, and playing, uh, you know, in the, either in the, you know, the Sevens, in, in this and World Sevens or, or the World Club Challenge in 94 with Wigan, you know, when we beat Brisbane. So, you know, it was probably too much rugby, you know, uh, looking back. But, you know, I just love playing. I just love playing. I, you know, I would have played all year round for as long as I could. But, you know, the modern sportsman now <laughs> with the modern science, you know, some of the things that we did back then uh, was was silly. But, you know, it was, it was an enjoyable time. And as I say, I really did love playing in Australia. Yeah, well, uh, on Fox at the moment, Fox Sports or Fox League at the moment, uh, during the off-season, they sometimes replay some of those old games. And uh, I think the other day that uh, Roosters-St. George game was on uh, that you were playing. So it was, certainly was a great game to watch and you start in that game. And um, speaking about Australia, and, and it'd probably be wrong of me not to ask you about that 1992 uh, race against Lee Oden Ryan uh, at Parramatta Stadium. Um, I've I've spoken to Lee about that race. Uh, it'd be great to hear your story about that race at uh, uh, Parramatta Stadium. What What are your recollections of that run and and that night? Um, um, you know, it wasn't really that deep for me. Um, you know, I was offered a lot of money to run a race uh, before, um, I think I'd actually, <laughs> the ironic thing was I got paid more to run in that race than I got paid for beating Australia in Melbourne. Yeah, and that yeah. is one of the, to this day, the biggest, and that's one thing, the funny thing about life is that, um, you know, um, I, I I did a, another race in eight, when I came out in 88, I think it was at a dog track. I beat um, Dale Ferguson, uh, no, Chicka Ferguson and Dale Shearer yep. uh, in a race. No one ever talks about that race. I won it comfortably. <laughs> yeah, no one ever talks about that race. But the race in that race in '92, and I had another race. I've actually beaten the European indoor 200 meter champion, a guy called Addy Maffey, and I've beaten Dave Grinley, who is an international 400 meter um, uh, runner, international 400 meter, and the 200 meter indoor European champion. Imagine how big that is. Oh, I've also beaten I've also beaten Jonathan Edwards, who is the GOAT of Triple Jump. And that's on my go that's on my um Instagram page. And yep. go and see some stuff about me, go check my Instagram page. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, I beat him at standing long jump in two thousand. It was so embarrassing that it was this is a, it was on on TV in, on this uh, thing called the Sports Personality of the Year. They used to have these uh, things events, and they got a guy who'd beaten Jonathan who who beat Jonathan Edwards' record at school, a guy called Steve Jomo who's a rugby player, and they'd stand in long jump, and I jumped the distance to win uh, a bronze medal in the 1905 Olympics. Wow. I've done some incredible things. These things are never talked about or mentioned. Yeah. But when I lose a race to a guy <laughs> called Leo Ryan, that is the thing. I talk about more in my life. And that's why the funny thing is like, you know, <laughs> the, when you're up there, you know what I mean? It's only, it's, if, if Usain Bolt wins a race, it's nothing, isn't it? If someone beats Usain Bolt, they can live off that. There are players in this country who live off the fact they tackled me. They tackled me. There's people that write on social media and go, I remember that day Phil Ford tackled you uh, at Headingley and when he mowed you down from... Uh, across uh, the pitch or I remember that time Dave whatever he's I can't even remember his name Dave somebody tackled me playing when I played for Wakefield or you know that's, and I think to myself wow that's how big you've become when people talk about the times you didn't score the the time that you didn't score against them and I think that that I just think that's when you've made it and when people make their careers off the fact that you know because 
there's people in um, you know, no disrespect to the other rider, no fantastic players had a career for um, uh, at Parramatta and in NRL, but it's no one in the in England would know who, who most rugby league would know Leo de Rive is unless he be, if, unless he, he beat me in a race, and it's and it's and people love it the fact that you're meant to be so amazing, but you know we're all human, we all have off days, yeah, definitely. But uh, and you can lose the race, even Usain Bolt's lost races, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not many, but he's, he's lost races. Yeah. And in my career, I, I have a few races, as I say, I've only lost one race, and that was to, to Lee Oden Ryan. And uh, as I say, we got there, you know, I'm not gonna have excuses or whatever you know he beat me in a race uh fair and square and i give it to him even though he did come out on a podcast and say that recently was it a talking something podcast he did with uh with somebody and um he came out and said that he you know practiced and you know went on the being the band with his um um uh, you know the guy who was starting the race so he knew when it, and you can see if you watch the um you watch the, uh, the the video, the replay. He does get off, and it startles me because he, he's out of the blocks, and I just couldn't make it up. But you know what people also forget is in that game, even though I think Parramatta won it, I scored two tries against Leo Duran. He tried to catch me, couldn't catch me. Yeah. Uh, but all those things get forgotten, <laughs> and everyone just focuses on that. And that's that about life. You can't you can't pick what you're remembered for or whatever. You know, and it is. But I think you know the way I see it is it adds to notoriety. It's given. Uh, Leo and Ryan, something to talk about. And, you know, it's nice to have a bit of banter, you know. Life's all, not all about success. It's about the ups, the downs, and it's about creating memories for people. You know, people, I'm sure there's lots of Parramatta fans who will say, oh, I remember, because it was quite, you know, um, uh, quite a packed stadium that night, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, I think it was I think it was on Channel 9. It was The game was on Channel 9. And a lot of people saw it. And there's lots of, you know, so much folklore's come up out of it. <laughs> people keep saying, oh, all, apparently all the... Um, um, Great Britain team won a handsome, uh, you know, sum of money by betting on Lee because I threw the race and all that. And that's all poppycock, as we say over here. You know, he he beat me. You know, if he cheated or not, I don't know because you know you can say what he he, he is. It's, I I don't know. I had a race. I lost the race. Scored two tries. You know, I'm happy. Well. well... For us uh, long-suffering Parramatta fans, 1992 wasn't the best of years for Parramatta, and yeah. to to not only for Parramatta to beat Great Britain that night, that was, that was a massive night um, for a struggling Parramatta side to win against it. That was massive. So that was probably one of the season highlights for for Parramatta fans. But um, Lee says to say hello, and he. Actually, he also has the utmost respect for you as a rugby league player because uh, you've done, in his words, you've done so much more than what he did in the game of rugby league. So um, he's got the utmost respect for yourself. No, I've got the utmost respect for him as well. Anyone who beats in a race, you know, you've got to have respect for that person. Well, you made your, you really did make, you made your mark at Widnes when you started, but you really made your career at Wigan. Um, what did it mean to play at such a prestigious club uh, as Wigan? Was there even more expectation to do better than what you were doing before? Um, you know, I think my try scoring rate is, is pretty similar at, at both clubs, you know, about 140 something games and uh, I think 180 something tries there and thereabouts at each club, you know, spending, you know, near enough a similar time, you know, four and a half, around about four and a half years. Um, so it's pretty similar. And, you know, uh, people say my try at Wembley in 94 against Leeds, you know, when I round Alan Tate is, you know, the greatest try I've ever scored. It's the try I'm going to be remembered for. As I said, there's a statue of me outside Wembley, you know, uh, in the pose that I adopted uh, when I, when I, uh, you know, had scored the try after it had been scored, my celebration, you know, when I went down to my knees and put my head in my hands. But, you know, arguably the best try I've ever scored was either, you know, at Old Trafford against um, against New Zealand, when I picked the ball up from dummy half, you know, in my own 20-metre uh, area and, um, and go the length of the pitch, beating the whole team. Uh, or the try I scored for... W- Witness against Wigan, which probably got me to Wigan in 1989, the championship decider where we played Wigan. And it was basically winner takes all, whoever wins that game, last game of the season, packed out. And to come up with a hat-trick in that game, um, you know, it's cemented my legacy at the Witness Club. And was, uh, and I think after that, um, 
uh, Morris Lindsay, you know, before he passed away, uh, told me that um, it was that game that got hit, <laughs> that got me to Wigan because Wigan had a habit of, uh, you know, signing players who had yeah. good games against them, and you know, literally, uh, you know, helped to take the championship away from them that year, and uh, you know, that was uh, during the period of Wigan's dominance. So to lose the the uh, the championship that year, what was um, was big, and uh, yeah, you know, I just made a career of. Um, not only scoring tries, but scoring, you know, you know, what I like to call, um, you know, works of art, you know, I put a lot of my tries up now because I, I enjoy watching them. I, I enjoy sharing them with people, you know, a lot of them on my Instagram page. And, you know, I, I looked at try scoring as, as a thing of beauty, you know, you know, to, to, you know, beating people and how you did it and, and, you know, seeing things that other people did and, and remembering things and, you know, being able to beat, you know, present in that moment. Yep. And a lot of people, you know, um, ask me, and I do a lot of, uh, you know, mindset stuff now, you know, you know l learning the lessons that the habits that put into place, because people are successful because of the things that they think and the things that they believe and the things that they do, even if they're not aware of that, even if they're not conscious of it, you know, even if it's being unconsciously competent, you are still being competent. And that's because of, you know, habits that you do every day. You know, as you say, there are players you can have, as we've seen it, there are players who can have, you know, fantastic games, you know, score hat tricks or or do things. But it's only certain players who can do that consistently year after year for a decade or more. You know, that that's on purpose. That's thought. That's, um, you know, because of habits, whether that's, you know, you take can take the credit for it or whether it's because it's been ingrained in you from being within a, a culture of a club or a certain individual or uh, something in your life, be that a positive or, or, or a negative, you know, losing a loved one and, you know, who, who helped you, inspired you, or, or someone giving you some support at a time, or someone not believing you and you saying that you're going to show them, you know, just having that desire to create a way to be successful and, being, and knowing oneself, knowing one's strengths, you know, uh, you know, reading the game, learning from other players. And that is all mental. It's more than, you know, just being the, the biggest, fastest uh, beast on the pitch. And, um, yeah, you know, for me, that's that's what rugby is about. And, you know, I found that in Australia, it, it was different, you know. And, you know, just because I had to adapt slightly. But, um, you know, I was still me. I yep. still put myself into a, a different environment. And, um, you know, um, that's what I did, you know, when I went to witness when I went to Wigan, it was a different stage. It was more pressure. It was that, but I'm still me. You know what I mean? I thought to myself, you know, I can still. I'm, why should I feel pressure? I'm playing with better, better players. You know, Witness had a fantastic team, but when I went into that Wigan uh, dressing room, you know, I was in all the people like Dean Bell, you know, Sean Edwards, um, you know, Gene Miles. Wow, yeah. to play with, I couldn't believe I was. I had Gene Miles as my <laughs> centre. You know, that was to this day. I'm still in awe of the fact that. I, I, I only played half a season with um, uh, Gene Miles, but I scored 35 tries in ha that half season, 10 tries in one game, five yeah, tries in another game. I think I scored, I think I scored about 17 tries in two weeks. Yeah, wow. Which I'm not sure if it's a record, but that's got to be some oh, kind of record. Right somewhere. up there for sure. I mean, 10, try <laughs> 10, 10 tries in a game. That's unbelievable, to be honest. I know. I, I think uh, Bevan French recently uh, got seven for Wigan. And uh, I think he came off on uh, you know on the 60th minute, and I, was, I said to him, "Why don't you stay on, mate?" I said, "If you, you know if you break that record, that would instantly create a legacy for you, and then people will be talking about the both of us again." You know, um, it is yeah. Even now, you know, I, I remember because I had children late, and I remember uh, my kids, um, you know, saying to me, "Dad, how many tries?" Because when they were playing rugby, I said, they said, oh, what's the most tries you've ever scored in a game, Dad? And I went, 10. They went, they did not believe me. It's yeah, not for YouTube yeah, to this day. Yeah. And my kids and my oldest is uh, um, uh, a rugby union at uh, Rugby Union Academy at London Irish. And, uh, you know, he's, he's doing quite well and, and wants to be a, a rugby union uh, player. And, um, you know, <laughs> when he was young, yeah, he, he could not believe that I'd scored 10 tries in a game. And I'd say, if I'd shown him the replay on YouTube, to this day, he wouldn't have believed me. Yeah, no, that's an amazing feat. And uh, no doubt Gino helped you out with a lot of those 10 as well. Oh, yeah, he did. You know, uh, the, the whole team did. But playing out outside, you know, Gino was at that stage of life. You know, fantastic. Uh, he had fantastic hands, you know, fantastic ball player. Um, you know, coming towards the twilight of his career, 
Um, you know, he could offload, but, you know, Gino didn't want to run 50 metres. He'd run 20 metres, but he didn't want to run 50. And he was just like, there you yeah, go, and yeah, I'd pop yeah. up. And he, yeah. he'd just get up. I think, um, you know, I, I think one of the, the tries he gave me, he kind of went inside and I went that way. And he was looking for me and he couldn't <laughs> find each other. And then he finally managed to get the ball to me. And, uh, and managed, I think it was my eighth or ninth try. And I managed to put it down and I was like, yeah, you know, I just thought to myself, you know, you got to get 10. You know, I think it's a beauty, it's something, you know, as I said, life, life is, a, and, and rugby league for me was about poetry. And I always thought to myself, if I'd have scored nine tries, you know, it's like nine tries. If you scored nine tries or seven tries, no, I've scored, I think I've scored a, a hat trick or should I say f- three tries or more on 50 one occasion yeah, that's unbelievable. I think, you know i think that's wow. 52 if you if you include my um you know hat trick i think 53 if you score i think i've scored about two or three hat tricks in australia as well uh yeah. you know for one in in uh the the win for cup as it was back then and and two two or three for great britain yeah no that's unbelievable uh, that's where you know you that's where you know you've scored a hat trick but you can't remember how many hat tricks you scored. <laughs> but in england in england i think i've scored hat trick or more 51 times but, you know, I've scored like five tries, scored six tries. Uh, but, you know, so something about the magic call, about the number 10. Now, yeah. if it was 11 or 12, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been the same. But 10 is just like, wow, it's 10. Oh. And just like, it, it just it just sounds good, doesn't it? You know, you well, say, you can, hold your, you can one, hold your fingers person. up all that, can't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just like 10, it's just like, yeah, just like, wow. Even to this day, when I say it, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And I think to myself, wow, I'd love it before I pass away. I could see, that's what I, I think the beauty, of, I could see someone else do it. You know, yeah, give it a few more years, you know, yeah. if, I, if I live long enough, maybe someone else will do it um, in England, you know, but it'd be pretty tough to do it in the in the NRL. And, you know, anywhere now, because I say, you know, um, I, I was at a perfect time in, in rugby league where, you know, especially playing in, in England, where, you know, Someone who's had the stats that I had probably wouldn't stay in the same place okay. yeah. long enough to break break records. You know, people can, you know, if you imagine if you were doing the things that I was doing back yeah. then, mate, someone's going to come, you know, Wigan paid 440,000. If you was going to get somebody, yeah. you can say, I guarantee if this person doesn't get injured, he's going to be the top try scorer every single year. Because that's what I basically said. You know, I think I topped the try scoring charts on about seven or eight occasions, I think. And, um, you know, I literally, the only reason, I, the only seasons I didn't was seasons I had injuries. Every yeah. season, I don't think there was a, a season where I played the whole season and I wasn't the top try scorer. And that's pretty incredible, you know, when, you, when you're span, spanning a career. And, and that's pretty tough to do. Oh, and, uh, you know, just because I just felt like I had the cheat code. I just thought, like, you know, if people tried to put too much um, attention on me and I was all over the pitch, you know, I, I was about... If I just stay on my left wing, I can only score a certain amount of tries. I can only score a proportion of the tries that are scored on the left side of the pitch. Because if you, you know, now it's all about data, isn't it? You know, it's all about data, how fast players run. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything's about data. Back in my day, data was just tackle count <laughs> and hit, uh, maybe hit-ups. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was about it. How many hit-ups do you do? How many tackles do you make? But I was like, if I plotted... If I took the season before and said every try that Widnes scored and put it on a graph, I'd say there'd be, you know, a large pro- proportion of them would be on the left-hand side because I thought players pa- pass better from right to left hand. There'd be a certain number in the middle between the sticks and there'd be uh, a certain number on the right, yeah? So if you only stay on your left wing, you're only going to score the tries that are scored between the sticks and, uh, and the left-hand touchline looking at it. You know what I mean? So I, I thought, well, if I can read the game and be everywhere, you know what I mean? Because I saw what Ellery Hanley did. I saw what Sean Edwards did with their support play. You know, Terry Lamb was a great aficionado of it. I used to look at players and, and try and learn from them and think to myself, I can do what they can do. You know, I can do what Terry Lamb can do. I can, you know, be fit and, and back up every time and read the play. They can't pick the, the ball up in front of their own sticks. <laughs> and score. There's not many players who can nah. do that, but I've done that on a lot of occasions. But I know that just picking the the ball up under your sticks and uh, going length of the field, you ain't gonna get. You ain't gonna be the top try scorer doing that. That's like you know what I mean. Nah. <laughs> You've nah. got to have a combination of everything. So that's why when you look at those ten tries that scored, it was every single try in that, and I could score literally every single try. You know, if you are want to be brave <laughs> and, and put the pedal to the metal, if the try line's there. 
I'm going to do that. I probably ain't going to run that hard nah. if it's just coming off my line, except if it's Wembley, because, you know, that's when, you know, talking about tries. Yeah. You know, going back to that 19-4 try that I scored at Wembley, you know, which I'm going to be remembered for, uh, that was a, what I call a Jason Robertson run, you know, uh, just a hit up for your for your, for your team, uh, a selfless run. But then I ended up in, in the sunshine yep. and I thought, wow, if I imagine I, I could finish this, um, it's because this try is going to be remembered, and, you know, and, and to actually then go and finish it in a big um, um, stadium, because you know lots of great tries are, are won, but you know anyone would tell you what the hardest try to score individually is, isn't it? You know, yeah. Short of what I did, you know, picking the ball up from dummy half under your own sticks, as far as I'm concerned, is the, as an individual is the hardest try to score oh, in. Uh, in the, and that's why I say those are the least. If you want to talk about every single try scored, you know that is the, the hardest try. The second one hardest is probably to get the ball under your sticks from first receiver, and that's what I've done. That's what I did. You know that is probably you know short of picking the ball up from your end own end goal when the defence is set. They you either go from dummy half or they. You know what I mean, that's what a uh, big block of roach. That's the run. Yeah. That's a forward run. You know what I mean. That's a prop run. Yeah. So to do that in a Challenge Cup final in a big game early in the game, twelfth minute, when your team are under pressure, you know, and that that was a that was a selfless run. And and, and you know, I, I always see because I gave myself to the team. I was rewarded, and now for that try is going to, you know, I'm going to be remembered forever, you know, and, and lots of other people are talking about, you know, other tries and, you know, whether, you know, obviously Jonathan Davis scored a great try against the, kangaroo, the Kangaroos in, in, in 94 at, to Wembley when we went down to um, uh, 12 men when Sean Edwards got uh, sent off for, for <laughs> close line and Bradley Clyde or there, there are other Wigan tries, but all those tries have involved, you know, you know, if I, I come and I give you the ball and you're running, yeah, that's different, you know, yeah, yeah. or that other people are involved. But as your own, as an individual, any player in a big game who's picked the ball up from dummy half or gone first receiver under your sticks, not in the corners, nah. under your sticks, yeah. that I don't care what anyone says. And any, I'll, I'll argue till, I'm de- till I die. As an individual, that is the hardest try to score ah, definitely and that's definitely. why you don't see that you don't see many of them and i think that's why it is as it is and you know i'm not saying it's the greatest try i'm saying that is the hardest try to score and that's why there's not many people in rugby league who have scored a try like that nah. <laughs> so if you have scored a try like that there's not many people uh, any other try you know it could be whatever you know it's shipped along or whatever but Anyone who knows anything about rugby league will tell you they know what hard yards is, and if you and that's selfless. You're not doing that to to, to score a try. Are you doing nah. that to help your team out? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, t- talking about being remembered, uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times. The statue outside Wembley that must be a absolute massive honour to have that out there. Um, how many other statues are there? Um, I think of uh, there's five of us on the on the on the okay. rugby league. Um, uh, statue uh it's okay it's um myself i know alex murphy ironically alex murphy <laughs> wrote a story about me in the daily mirror on the day of the 1994 challenge cup final and that's also on my instagram page yep. uh saying i was finished i've kept that newspaper it was my motivation going to go. he said i was finished i'd lost my bottle with the best of a bad bunch that's why in life it's not about and this is a great player saying this about me a great player uh, you know, and he's on that statue with me. That's how great he is, Alex Murphy, you know. Uh, and he said that about me. And, you know, someone else might have let that affect them, you know. That's why in life, if negativity is given to you, whether somebody punches you in the face on the pitch, whether someone says something about you bad in the press, whether your own speckies are booing you, saying you're rubbish or whatever, or whatever it is, yeah, don't let that crush you. Believe in yourself. And that, I that from that day because and that's why there was so much in that try you know I had such success in Wigan at Wigan in, in 92 it was phenomenal um, you know from the Nissan 7s to, to winning the Lance Todd scoring 10 tries 5 tries in the semi-final winning the championship yep. uh, so much it's like like people it was incredible to then in 93 dislocate, dislocating my shoulder uh, against um, uh, against Penrith playing for East coming back being, you know, not being paid by Wigan, having to go out doing other jobs. Uh, Wigan thinking, 
saying they're going to get rid of me. Uh, signing um, uh, Viga to Gamala, having Jason Robinson, the spectators not believing in me, you know, going through a bit of a tough time. Uh, ha having to seek um, solace from Sean Edwards, who was a good pal of mine, uh, you know, managing then to uh, convince John Dorahey that I was worth, you know, putting back into the team. Having all that bullshit written about me in the press. Imagine that's a national newspaper. Yep. It's like the Sydney Morning Herald waking up in the morning of a grand final and like Wally Lewis in the Sydney Morning Herald or the Telegraph saying that, you know, you're rubbish. Yeah. You're the best of a bad bunch. Yeah. And then having to go out and play the grand final That's and then it. going out, scoring two tries, winning the man of the match and scoring a try that you knew was the pinnacle of your career. Even now I'm going, wow, yeah. I yeah. can feel it. I'm going to I'm gonna remember those emotions for the rest of my life. That's what I get because I, I managed to, if I let it crush me or didn't have a, a great performance that day, you know, I might have gone, I might have... I, all what I'd achieved before might have been gone. But after doing that, and that's why when people watch that, they go, were you just knackered? I said, no, it wasn't. Yeah, I was a little bit puffed. You know, so yeah, you yeah, the four legs of the pitch. But I was just, my mind was blown. That is the pit that I knew in that moment, that was the pinnacle of my life. I don't care what I do. You know, even you know, I love my kids. My kids have been born. I love my wife. I love everything. But the emotions I felt that day are something that, ordinary people will not feel because no. you have not been through of that to have the whole to, to have something and thinking the whole country the daily mirror was the number one paper in the country the whole and it's not often i don't know if you know but rugby league in england you know even though it's got you know it's big in wigan and sort of these towns nationally it was only about the challenge cup that was yeah. the one day that rugby league had national coverage that for that one okay, day well, yeah. It had that natural. It was the day that rugby league came to London, and the whole country would watch it. Fantastic viewing figures, and every, the whole country was aware of rugby league. You know, we're going to play. Okay, we're doing it. So people who didn't even like rugby league would be watching it, and then to see that in the newspaper, and then to go out and do that, I I just thought I could not believe what I'd done. I thought this is, you know. Uh, Life can't, I don't care if I won a World Cup, I don't think anything, it wouldn't get for me any bigger than on that day. And to have all those motions and then to think to myself, hang on a minute, we haven't even won the game yet. <laughs> this is only 12 minutes gone. Yeah. But it put us on the route to winning the game and I scored another try. You know, it's still a great try, but not going to be in the same breath of that. And that's what people don't realise. It's like, I scored 501 tries in my career, 501, you know, and... That is the and one. That is the and one. I always say that that try was the and one. That's the one. It's like the, the you know the iceberg that sank like the Titanic. <laughs> yeah. The five hundred is below yeah. because for the great and sporting public, I was on a, a show on just on on Friday, and uh, it was a uh, question of sport. Uh, you know, a, a quiz show they have, and they were talking about the statue and, and everything. And, and this is a, a national show, and you know, I've been retired. You know. 20 plus years, but you know, it's done a lot of reality TV shows, you know, and you know, what I've achieved, you know, still resonates with people. And, um, you know, just people talking about that try and people was going, mind if I only scored that one try, but that one try is the one try, of, you know, the iceberg above the <laughs> Everything else is the body of work, all the, all what you had to go through, being called an uncoordinated clown by St. Helens. I'm not getting picked by England. Um, you know, having to, you know, uh, do all that I did for witness. Then, you know, everything you've done lead, led up to that moment. You know, even from playing rugby at school, my parents sending me to a boarding school, you know, try, everything I thought came to that one moment above. And that's the one moment that anyone who knows anything about rugby league, about me, about, you know, even if they're just going to, to Wembley to watch, um, uh, you know, a pop, pop concert, they'll walk past the statue and go, who's, who's this? Why is he on his knees with his head in his hands? <sighs> and that, you know, stimulates a bit of curiosity. Yeah, and I say that is the sure. M1. And it is the whole story because in life, I always say that, um, you know, careers can be forgotten, but moments last forever. You know, when well, I, I've got some great, Moments, you know, when I I remember that moment I was at the Sydney Football Stadium when uh, Wally Lewis was, uh, you know, coming off uh, the pitch when he, I've forgotten the name of the, the New South Wales second row, he was at, who was barging with me. Oh, having my a, guy, a fight, Big MG. Right, guy, yeah, yeah. Big MG when he's coming off, you know, uh, Thurston kicking those goals in that grand final. You know what I mean? That there are moments, uh, you know, Pat Richards when he scored his, his try uh, for West in, in that grand final. You know what I mean? There are moments 
rugby league moments which will which will, will I remember forever, you know what I mean? And they'll stick out. And I've created my one moment that, you know, is known nationally in this country, you know, and that that's it. And so some people, you know, when they talk about that, 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 but that's that one moment, that one moment that sticks on top of the, the cherry on, on the cake, uh, which, which gets you, that's what you want moments. You know what I mean? People are not gonna remember stats, stats, 501 tries, 601 tries, who cares? But, you know, just that emotional connection, that thing of beauty. It's like, I remember watching, um, I used to watch, let's say, what, love watching old uh, uh, Aussie uh, videos of the old Wilmfield Cup. And I used to see uh, Eric Grove was oh, like, yeah. the guru, mate. He, yeah. uh, I mean, the original, not the, <laughs> not, not Mark II, <laughs> not, the, not the sequel. He was a good player, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> not quite Beverly Hills Cop one, uh, but uh, but uh, you know, but I used to love watching. And he used to run. You know, he was such a big man, but he had you know he had he still had grace. And I used to love watching, um, you know, rugby league and the beauty of it. And you know, the aesthetics, how people, even Wally Lewis, you know, was a bit of a podgy. But sometimes when he used to sell those dummies and left and right, and it was a thing of beauty. And I always thought that that's what you want to do. Is that you know, it, it's not so much about winning and losing. It's about going out there and communicating with the people in the stands, you know. It's like the biggest compliment that people ever pay me in this country if I walk up and down the street when they say, you know what, well, I don't even like rugby, but I used to love watching you, or you got me into rugby, or you did something, you actually moved, you connected with people. Because it's easy to connect with Wigan fans, you know. Yeah. As you know, it's easy, as you say, for George Hodgson to connect with para fans. All you have to go do is go out and win a grand final. But at Wigan... They did a lot of winning, so it was more than winning. It was, I mean, if you connect with people, chances are you've won anyway, yeah? yeah, yeah. But just winning, winning doesn't make you get remembered forever. It's, 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 you've got to aim for something higher than that. You've got to create a connection with people, go beyond that. And I was always about, that's what I wanted to do. In 92, I still, you know, no one talks about my 92 performance at, um, at Wembley. I, I still scored two decent tries and one, the Lance Todd that day after just being bought for 420, but no one remembers that. Yeah. As I said, you can do great things because it doesn't connect with people because you've got something else greater. 93, I got knocked out. And 99, um, uh, you know, play, scored the opening try for London. No one remembers those stuff. People only remember 94 because that was a thing of beauty. And that was, I was like, like that was, that was, uh, it was iconic, you know what I mean? And you, and I felt it and I felt it. And, um, you know, I, it wasn't a, uh, you know, choreographed performance. I was just, just, um, just being present in that moment, and you know that moment has been captured. You know, it's been, you know, it's, you you walk around Wembley. You know, there's photos of it. There's a bar named after the try. There's a bar at Wembley Stadium, not named after me, but it's named after the try. It's called the 1994. Oh, okay. Bar, named after yeah. my try, yeah. but it's not named after me because <laughs> when the new web. Wembley was redeveloped in 99 and didn't open again to, I think, 2006, 2007. And then all the bars have got yep. different um, years and they're all named after something um, incredible that happened at Wembley that year. Like there's the 1966 bar named okay. after, obviously, um, England winning the World Cup, the soccer world, or football World Cup, as we call it, soccer, as you call it, uh, World Cup in 66 and mine's a 94 bar. But when that statue went up in in uh, 2000 and. Uh, 15 i think it was you know so that's a, a long time between drinks uh it's from 94 but to see to see it yeah it, it literally brought me to tears because it took me back to that moment oh, back yeah, to the definitely. morning yeah for sure back to the morning waking up w back Reading to walking paper. around wembley uh with the paper in my there's a, a i think a, a clip of me i'm um, being interviewed before the game and I didn't have much to say because I used to hate being interviewed before games because okay, I think to myself, yeah. I want to be interviewed after the game. Because if you're a winger and someone's interviewing after the game, chances are you've done pretty well. If you're a winger, <laughs> I say to any wingers, <laughs> and there's been a big game and someone's come to, because it's, you know, wingers, we don't get, we don't get much love. And they say it's the easiest position on the field to play, but the hardest position to, to play well and have an impact. If you're a winger and you win like the Dali M, if you're a winger and you win <laughs> man of the match, chances are you've done something incredible. Yep, if yep. you're a half back and you win man of the match, mate, you might put a few, you could put a few chips in, throw a few missed balls, you've done your job. Haven't balls. You? <laughs> you've done your job. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't have to do something that's going to be remembered forever. Yeah. But chances are, if you're a winger and it's a big game, 
state of origin, uh, uh, test match, challenge cup, grand final, and you're a winger, you win man of match, chance to chance you've done something special. See, these are all things that were in my brain. So that's why I knew, like, and, I, and I'd already won, um, uh, you know, a Lance Todd before, and I don't know how many wingers have won uh, two Lance Todds. I don't know if any, uh, I don't know if, I, don't, I doubt it, no. There's lots of records that I may or may not have won, <laughs> I don't know, you know. That's too short, but um, um, definitely uh, those things were mine. I, it was just, you know, it was just about creating things of beauty. It's about connecting with people because if you can go out there and someone, you know, people just remember your name. You know, I always think to myself now, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but if I walk down the street and someone says, you might fire, and I think, well, I've been retired for 22 years. Uh, I think it's from rugby, uh, yeah, 23. I think I, my last Super League season was for Salford 2001. So it's about, yeah, 22 years. And I think, so if someone can still remember something I've done, I've connected with you emotionally somewhere that, you know, you've seen something and you've gone, probably gone, wow. If you see something and gone, wow. And that's why, you know, if people still remember that I've, I lost the race to, to Leo de Ryan, I'll take that because I'm still connecting with them. He still remembers, you know. Uh, so you don't know what you're going to be remembered for. And if chances are, if you're remembered, you've connected emotionally with people. And that's, that's what life's about. It's really going out there and, and positively connecting with people. That's, that's, that's all you want. You know, at the end of the day, I'm sure you want all your, you know, your, your power team, you want George Hodgson to, to do well and all the power team to do well, but you want them to go out there and, you know, you want to see them bleed for, for power, don't you? How did yeah, they go yeah, out definitely. there, you know, if they, if they, however they go, you know, you know, if you've got a good team, if you've got a not great team, but if they, if they give it 100% and, um, you know, um, perform to their maximum and everyone else has done their job right, i.e. they've got a decent team together, you think, We've got to go far. We've got, if they, if the team forms the maximum, and that's the way you connect with the crowds, is just giving it your all, doing something that makes them go wow, makes yeah. them go wow. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. If they all do something and you, and you come off, you go wow. You know, that's all you're trying to get them to do. You're not trying to win the game. You're trying to make your own fans go wow. Yeah. If you can do that, you've achieved, mate. You've achieved, and the, the winning and losing will take care of itself. Yeah, no, nah, that's pretty good advice there. And um, just speaking of statues, I think there's only about four or five in Australia, I think. There's the Jonathan Thurston statue, there's the Wally Lewis statue, and I think Cameron Smith and uh, Billy Slater down in Melbourne. Um, oh, there's a few more at the Sydney Cricket Ground of, of rugby league players, but uh, they're the ones that stand out for me. And... Having a statue, as you said, uh, every time I go to Suncorp Stadium, I'm always getting a picture out, out next to Wally, the Wally statue, so because it's always there. So, yeah, massive. It's, it's nice when I go to Wembley. You know, it's nice of a meeting point. Yeah, uh, nah, I, definitely. I go, to, I go to Wembley. They say, "How oh, where should we meet?" I'm like, "Really, really? You're gonna <laughs> yeah, ask me that?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it could be the uh, 1994 bar. You could meet at the 1994 bar. Uh, yeah, it's we'll meet at a statue and we'll go to the 1994 bar. Uh, yeah, that's A good it. day was had. D do you get free drinks at the 1994 bar or? N no, I don't. I don't. Oh. I don't. You know, I think I should. Yeah. I was actually going to, I, I was actually at the Euros uh, recently, you know, the, the European uh, finals um, uh, with my son. And um, uh, I managed to blag my way into the bar, in one of the bars. Because I don't normally, I don't do that, do you know who I am thing. But I was like, yeah, uh, yeah. literally the entrance to, the VIP, because I didn't have VIP tickets, I just had ordinary tickets. But I was with my son, but I knew some friends of mine were up in the VIPs. And where the entrance to the VIP was right, and you could see out the window my statue, and I thought, come on, <laughs> the gods are telling you, you've got, you've got to use it. And I, was, I went up to the bloke, and I went, uh, I'm just come to get my mates. And he goes, uh, have you got a ticket? I said, no. I said, no, but that's my statue just there. And he went, what, you mind about it? Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he let me in, so in. I thought, yeah. <laughs> it's got... <laughs> Got me free drinks on that day, so yeah, all good. Ah, nice. Well, we'll wrap things up with the personality questions, uh, like I like to call a set of six. Um, and we'll start off with, what's your favourite holiday destination and why? Oh, uh, Sydney does come in a close second because I love it, but Ibiza. Okay. Ibiza's my number yeah. one. I love the energy on that island and been going there since uh, 1995, love it. Ah, nice. How does Martin Afire relax when you have a day off? What's the one thing you love to do? I love to do, to relax. I love to chill. I love to Netflix and chill. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I music, obviously. Uh, I DJ. I like to have hobbies that pay. 
yeah. rather than hobbies that cost you a lot of money. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when I get out to to do my hobby, yeah, you know, I'm all, I'm bar- invariably get paid for it. So yeah, I I, I DJ a lot of music. Ah, uh, nice. Oh. Uh, you've given. Uh, what is your favourite piece of advice you've been given from someone in your life? My favourite piece of advice I've been given. A, Probably my dad. My dad wrote a book called Understanding Your Emotions, and he um, gave me a bit of advice. He said, "Martin, if you're ever unsure of who you are or where you're going in life, just look around you." Um, and that is the best bit of advice because he said, "You know, if everyone around you is a professional sportsman, chances are you're a professional sportsman. If everyone around you is a bank robber, chances are you're a bank robber." So you know. Um, now they've got like all these modern terms that you know, you know the five uh, people you associate closest with and, <laughs> and and all that. But yeah, that that's what he that's what that's always stuck with me. Oh, and nice. uh, you know, so you you know, so if you want to become like someone, hang around with those type of people. <laughs> you know, it's hard to if you want to be a millionaire to hang around with millionaires because um, you um, um, you know if you're not a millionaire, but if you can bring value to millionaires. Even if it's that getting them coffee and hang around them, then chances are, you know, you've got more chance of becoming a millionaire. So that's what another thing it taught me is life is about adding value to other people's lives. Even if it's that, you know, even if it's like cracking jokes, you know, then people like having you around because you're the funny guy or you're the handsome guy or you're the guy that is good at chatting up girls or you're the guy that pays for everything or you're the guy that gives people positive energy. You know, whatever it is, you're doing something for other people. And I always thought I did that when I played rugby, you know, I was creating excitement for other people uh, who would then create excitement for me because you feed off other people's energy. Ah, nice. Now, if you weren't a career sportsman, what, what profession do you think you would have taken up? I always think that's a tough question to ask because, you know, I'm very much a, a burn the boats mentality type of person that my identity is so wrapped up in who what being might and chariots of fire that I can't be anybody else. Um, you know, I, I you know I could pick something and say yeah. I like this. I could have done that. Done a lot of cooking shows. Uh, one come dine with me over here. Uh, could have been a chef. Could have been this. There, were, I would have could have turned. There's lots of things that I could have turned my hand to, but you know. I am mine chariots of fire, yep. and that's 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 who I am. Yeah, no, that's it's, fair enough. It's like ask, it's like asking the you know the queen, who, who would you be if you not be the queen? You don't know, <laughs> she's been the queen. You know, God rest her soul, she's no longer with us. But what you know, it's probably like asking Ronaldo, who would Ronaldo be, or asking Messi, who would they be? It's just like when you are so something, you can't. You know, people who, who could answer that question, you know, chances are, you know. It's like asking Muhammad Ali <laughs> or, or Pele or, you know, that's that's the mindset. Well, uh, okay, this one might be just a, a off-topic then, an easier one or it might be a hard one. What You mentioned uh, cooking there, come dine with me. Uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Oh, <laughs> I, I, um, I uh, would have to say... Um, I cook and I cooked a Nigerian curry. I cooked a Nigerian curry, so chicken curry. Well, I can literally turn my my um, my hand to anything. But um, yeah, at the moment I'm a bit of a, a short order American diner cook for for the kids because they love pancakes, uh, waffles, oh. uh, chicken burgers, uh, you know, stuff like that. So anything American dinery, um, you know, the kids they, they love that kind of stuff because who doesn't love an American diner? That's right uh, up my alley. Yeah, I can, <laughs> Sounds nice. So, so at, at, at the moment, that but you know, for myself, um, I um, can't get past a well cooked, uh, well cooked steak, medium rare. Nice, nice. What was the first concert or first album that you bought? Um, the first album I ever bought, I think, was a Michael Jackson a Thriller. Uh, yeah, good one. Is it? That was a long long time ago. Yeah, nah, definitely champion album that one. Um, What uh, is one of your favourite all time songs off that album, or is there another one that is one of your favourite all time Um, songs? My favourite all time song, um, I would say, would have to be. uh, It's a house music song. 
uh, say since I've been retired, uh, you know, done my fair bit of clubbing. I, I did a bit of clubbing back in the days, and I at, at the Horden Pavilion. Oh yes, <laughs> when, I, yes. when I was in Sydney uh, back in the day, uh, and uh, where else I used to go to in Sydney? Um, uh, God, uh, Oxford Street. It was all come back to me. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I used to love a bit of club club in Sydney. But I'd have to say that um, uh, a, a song called. Um, Waiting for You by uh, Dina Vass, Soul Avengers remix. Anyone who knows me as a DJ, I just knows that I used to play that song all the time. You know, not a, a, a you know, it's not a pop song, a well a well known song, but um, that's uh, one of my go to DJ tracks. Ah, nice. And the, wrap it up. What would you like to say to the fans of rugby league who have watched you play during your career? Um, I would like to say to the fans of rugby league those who have cheered me or booed me um uh both sets of fans um you know without you i wouldn't be anything because i fed off your energy you know i always turned it into positive energy whether it was positive cheers whether it was negative boos whether it was um you know uh how can i say it? insults let's leave it at that <laughs> racially charged insults um you know i fed off it and i fed off the energy of the crowd, and I would say, without spectators, you know, I would be nothing, and and we wouldn't have a sport. It is the fans who make the sport, and and you know, I bow to you, and I thank you. You know, the, the fans in Australia, um, uh, the fans in in England. You know, as I say, without them, you know, that's what got me up. You know, whether I knew that it was twenty thousand fans who, as it was sometimes, you know, up at the Boulevard in Hull, who hated me. That's what got me up. You know. The fact that I could stand in front of them with a smile on my face after I scored a try and just walk, look at individual people's faces in the crowd and see how much <laughs> upset I caused them. I fed off that and I loved it, you know. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, it sends a, uh, a chill um, up the back of my neck. And as I say, anytime I watch an old clip of mine, you know, and I see it and I see people, um, uh, you know, how excited I made them or how angry I made them. Yeah, it still does um, send a chill down my spine. Ah, nice. Well, as I said, I, I remember watching you play uh, growing up, watching rugby league and um, obviously watch the replay games now. So it certainly brought a lot of enjoyment to a lot of rugby league fans, as you said, both in England and Australia. Uh, so, Martin Charrett to fire. Thank you very much for allowing me to interview you, to interview you today. As I said, it brought back some, a lot of childhood memories, um, some good times. Um, and I hope if you're ever, ever in Australia, we can catch up and say good day. And thank you very much for coming on the Paracave podcast today. I could have spoken for hours. Um, there's so much to get through. But, uh, yeah, it was a really enjoyable chat. Well, I hope uh, Para have a, a big season this year. Um, I'm going to be uh, keenly watching a lot of the, the, the Parramatta games now that we've had this connection. I feel like I'm a bit of a, a you know, Parramatta is going to have to be one of my clubs now. You know, big shout out okay. to, yep. to Josh Hodgson. I hope you have a fantastic season, Josh, and uh, go Para. Well, welcome back, and thanks for listening to Martin Afire and his rugby league story. And what a really interesting story it was. What was your favourite part? Comment on the socials about what your favourite part of the interview was with Martin, and I'll be very interested to see what your favourite part was. Honestly, I could have spoken for hours. Uh, it was so interesting, and there were many more questions that I wanted to ask. But unfortunately, we just simply ran out of time. And um, at least, I guess, now we know we might have another English para fan uh, with that connection that I've made with him uh, and also with Josh Hodson playing there at the Eels this year. So we might have another international Eels fan. One thing for you, the listeners, uh, I've got a prize up for grabs of a $50 KO sports voucher. If you can tell me on the socials the big mistake that I made during the chat. Now, I'll give you a clue. It's to do 
when we are talking about Martin's statue at Wembley, and to be honest, I am really embarrassed and ashamed about the mistake I made. And when you know what it is, you will know why. So anyway, message your answer on the Paracave Podcast Instagram page. Uh, and if multiple people guess the answer right, I'll do some sort of random winner draw. Um, I'll also accept answers on the Paracave Podcast Facebook page as well. So between those two pages, uh, Instagram and Facebook, Put your comment down as to what you think the mis- the massive mistake was. Uh, I can't believe I uh, made that mistake, but anyway, um, comment your mistake uh, or the mistake that I made. Um, I'm pretty sure the cards only work in Australia, so it's open to Australian listeners only. Uh, but yeah, if we have multiple people say the same thing, we'll do some sort of random winner draw. So. Keep your ears open for that one. Uh, Once again, a quick shout out and thanks to Jack's Pale Ale, a fantastic major sponsor of this podcast for supporting the podcast. And don't forget, Jack's Pale Ale is available uh, for purchase in the club shop. It's perfect for that Eels fan or that beer lover that you know. Drop into the club shop and get some today and... Also, keep an eye on the socials for what's happening at Parramatta Leagues Club. Some Lunar New Year celebrations happening at the moment, so keep an eye out for that one. Uh, And also some exciting news coming out of the club this week is that the club members who attended the meeting during the week have voted in favour to amalgamate with Dural Country Club. So a great win for the members there with an exciting future at both the clubs as well. Thank you to co-sponsor Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group, who you hear at the top of the podcast each and every week. Uh, and as I said before, footy season is fast approaching. So to get your footy NRL footy merchandise head to www.thestubbyclub.com.au and use that Paracave discount code and get 10% off and also Bo Cook from Loan Market once again his contact number is 0401 213 236 and get in contact with him for a free chat and see how he and his team can get you on that best deal for your home loan. And also Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics on Instagram and Facebook. Contact him today if your car needs a detailing to make it all shiny and new looking uh, or just to you know, make yourself feel better driving around in a nice new shiny car looking, uh, shiny car, Uh, contact Scott as well and let him know that you heard it on the Paracave podcast. Please support these businesses that support the podcast each and every week. They help bring you quality entertainment uh, and please share the love on socials as well. Thank you listeners for listening uh, and don't forget if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so as soon as it drops you'll be able to listen to it. Encourage your families family and friends do the same as well any support would be most appreciated and please leave a five star rating and review on the podcast platform that you listen to it will be once again most appreciated and thank you once again to the official media partner of the podcast the Parramatta Times for all your local Parramatta news simply head to www.parramattatimes.com dot com dot au have a great week as best you can uh follow the podcast on the socials for some interesting content and to see who's coming up on the podcast both on instagram and uh facebook just search the paracave podcast but to sign off the show and if you've been listening for a while now you will know what i'm about to say or if you're a new listener Uh, My sign-off line is um, my sign-off line is to sign off the show. I always say the Paracave podcast by the fan for the fans.
Go Power!